particularly welcome you. We'd love to have you be a part of our class every week. Uh, what we're doing this time is going through the most significant texts in the Bible. And it may seem that we're you know, not moving as quickly as you thought we might. We will move more quickly uh, as we get farther along. But it seemed to me that we really need to have an understanding of the beginnings of the people called Israelites, um, how they moved from being... Uh, shepherds, nomadic shepherds who moved to watering holes where they could find them and grass where they could find them, uh, to a kingdom where they became both south and north and then united under David and remained united under Solomon and then split again so that you have some sense of that. We will be skipping over some places today that I think are not as important as others. But I think, again, as we shift now to the second really great king, Saul was pretty much a washout. David became strong in many ways, certainly had his failings. Solomon will be strong in many ways, will have his failings as well. And as we go through Second uh, Samuel and First Kings, this author is quick to point out where they are at fault. When you get to First and Second Chronicles, we won't spend as much time there because First and Second Chronicles are really a redo of, of the materials about David and Solomon. And uh, it's at a time when they don't need any more negative news. And so all the bad things about these guys are just completely wiped out of the Scripture. And uh, they become uh, people who can do no wrong. So the first telling, uh, I think we got, got you know far more of the truth. And then the second time, we get just the good news and not the bad. So we won't spend as much time there because I think the first telling of the story uh, is much more helpful to you and me. Uh, Let's pray before we start. God, we open your book and we know that every word, every verse and chapter of every book is a part of your word, but we also know that some of those who wrote were more keenly attuned to exactly what you had in mind, um, that you re- used real people to write this book, and sometimes they were much closer uh, to you and understanding your will and your purposes, and sometimes those who wrote drifted a little farther uh, away and were more influenced by their own time and place than in your revelation of those things that are forever true about you and about us. So help us read uh, with an intellect as well as a heart of faith and to find those things that are forever true. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's review quickly. I know we read the first few verses of 1 Kings last week, but we're going to reread those first few verses just to get us into the material, and then we'll be leaving David behind. He dies, and we move on to Solomon and see how he began to solidify the kingdom. Now, what I want to point out to you first of all is that in the ancient world, uh, they followed what was known as primogeniture, Primo meaning one, or the first in Latin. So the firstborn was supposed to inherit. Yet in the Hebrew scriptures, we discover a number of times when the firstborn did not become the one through whom God would work more effectively. Often it was secondborn or even farther down the list. Uh, That becomes important in trying to figure out who's going to succeed King David. So let's just remind ourselves of a few of those. The first son born to Abraham was Ishmael. But it was not Ishmael through whom God worked to establish the Israelite people. It was through the second born son, Isaac. Uh, Isaac and his wife would have uh, the, the one, uh, you know, who was, was very significant to them. And uh, then the other, uh, in the next generation, you have twins. Firstborn was Esau, but it will not be the firstborn uh, who will who will be the carrier of this uh, long train leading to the Israelite people. It will be the secondborn. It will be Jacob, not Esau. Jacob will father 12 sons, but it will not be the firstborn nor the second, third, fourth, who will be the one through whom the people uh, will more satisfactorily complete their journey. It will be through Joseph. 
Joseph will become the one who saves the people down in, in Egypt and, and sees to it that, that they are that they endure. Uh, so it's not always the firstborn. You have to be very attuned here to what God's doing, and sometimes um, he follows along with firstborn, and sometimes, no, no, it's not going to be the firstborn. It's going to be one farther down. So David's firstborn was Absalom. Absalom's dead now. Second, Adonijah. And so by the rules of that day and time, Adonijah sees that he should be king. And David's long-trusted and beloved military commander thinks that's the way it's going to go, and he sides with Adonijah. But the prophet, who becomes the, the number one holy man, sort of, if you would, of this period, is Nathan. And Nathan doesn't see God leading in that direction. Nathan sees God leading through Bathsheba, and, uh, and, and, and her son, Solomon. So that's the way this book begins. And how is Solomon going to displace Adonijah, and how will he solidify his kingdom? So later, if you hear only these wonderful stories about Solomon, let's begin with a very bloody beginning. It's the, the way he gets rid of all the other uh, opponents. And he does a Michael Corleone all in one afternoon while you're baptizing the baby. Kill them all in one afternoon. That's almost the way Solomon gets it done here. All right, chapter 1, 1 Kings. King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. So his servants said to him, Let a young virgin be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be his attendant. Let her lie in your bosom so that my lord the king may be warm. So they searched for a beautiful girl throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag. The Shunammite brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful. She became the king's attendant and served him, but the king did not know her sexually. He's an old old man. He's just trying to stay warm. Now Adonijah, son of Hagit, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. He prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him. His secret service, if you would. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, Why have you done thus and so? That's a real insight right there, folks. David has never been the father. He was not the father to Absalom until it was too late. In the battlefields of Gilead, David finally decided he wanted to be Absalom's father. It was too late. He's not been Adonijah's father. Yes, sexually, yes, he was the father. But he has not been the father. He has never disciplined this young man in any way whatsoever. That's what the writer's trying to tell you. But he's really good looking. <laughs> Have you seen how many times this is what's lifted up by the author? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. So he conferred with Joab, that's David's commander, of course, son of Zeruiah, and with the priest Abiathar, and they supported Adonijah. But the priest Zadok and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and the prophet Nathan and Shimei and Rei and David's own warriors, those who were closest to David, did not side with Adonijah. Skip to verse 11. So Nathan becomes the trouble stirrer upper here. Nathan said to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, Have you not heard that Adonijah, son of Hagit, has become king, and our Lord David does not know it? I mean, David's out of it. He's just trying to stay warm. Now therefore come, let me give you advice so that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. And by that he literally means, A, Adonijah will solidify his reign by getting rid of all competition. And that could be you and your son. Your head could be rolling down the street here. It's time to act. Go in at once to King David and say to him, did you not, my lord the king, swear to your servant, saying, Your son Solomon shall succeed me as king, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah king? 
Then while you are still there speaking with the king, I will come in after you and confirm your words. I mean, is this a plot or not? You go in and remind the king that's what he said, and if he still can't pull that up somehow, if he can't remember, I'll come rushing into the room and say, yes, that's what you said. That's the plot. So Bathsheba went to the king in his room. The king was very old. <laughs> the storyteller him he was really old. Abishag the Shunammite was attending the king. Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance to the king. And the king said, what do you wish? She said to him, my lord, you swore to your servant by Yahweh your Elohim, saying, your son Solomon shall succeed me as king and he shall sit on my throne. But now suddenly Adonijah has become king, though you, my lord, the king, do not know it. Skip to verse 20. But you, my lord, the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord and the king after him. Otherwise, it will come to pass when my lord, the king, sleeps with his ancestors that my son Solomon and I will be counted offenders. That is, we will be out and perhaps killed by Adonijah as he solidifies his rule. While she was still speaking with the king, the prophet Nathan came in, just as arranged. The king was told, here's the prophet Nathan. When he came in before the king, he did obeisance to the king with his face to the ground. Nathan said, my lord, the king, have you said Adonijah shall succeed me as king and he shall sit on my throne? For today he has gone down and sacrificed oxen, fatted cattle and sheep in abundance and has invited all the king's children, Joab, the commander of your army, and the priest Abiathar, who are now eating and drinking before him and saying, Long live King Adonijah. Skip to verse 28. King David answered, Summon Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence, stood before the king. The king swore, saying, As Yahweh lives, who has saved my life from every adversity, as I swore to you by Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, your son Solomon shall succeed me as king. He shall sit on my throne in my place. So will I do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the ground, did obedience to the king, and said, May my lord, King David, live forever. But since you're really old and can't even get warm, why don't you go ahead and die now and let my son take... Well, that's what he didn't write down here. King David said, <clears throat> Summon to me the priest Zadok, the prophet Nathan, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. And when they came before the king, the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gion. There let the priest Zadok and the prophet Nathan anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the shofar and say, Long live King Solomon. You shall go up following him. Let him enter and sit on my throne. He shall be king in my place, for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. So that is over the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes. All twelve. Look at verse 39. There the priest Zadok took the horn of oil from the tent. This is the tent of the presence, remember. There's no, no temple yet. No temple yet. So the tent where God's presence is acknowledged still sits just outside all the other residences, most of them still tents at this point. Um, they blew the shofar and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up following him playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth quaked at their noise. Wow, Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished feasting. When Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, Why is the city in an uproar? Oh boy, we've got trouble. Verse 45, the very last sentence this is the noise that you heard. Solomon now sits on the royal throne. Verse 49. Then the guests of Adonijah got up trembling and went their own ways. They thought Adonijah is oldest surviving son. Absalom was killed in the war over in Gilead. They thought Adonijah is next in line. 
But when they hear that David has gone a different direction and that here is Adonijah declaring himself to be king outside the new city and Solomon is sitting on the throne in the new city, they know they've got troubles. Oh boy, we've made a big mistake and they just start, you know, leaving. Adonijah, fearing Solomon, got up and went to grasp the horns of the altar. Remember that there was supposed to be a sanctuary. Sanctuary, for us, coming from Latin sanctus, meaning set apart. Same word we have, of course, for the room in which we now sit. The set apart place. So they had a ruling that if somebody was trying to kill you, you could run to the altar and catch hold of the horns and demand a fair hearing. A fair hearing. So that's what he does. He rushes down and grabs hold of the horns of the altar saying, Let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not kill his servant with the sword. Okay, Adonijah knows it's not going to happen. He's not going to be king. So now he's fighting for his life. I will not turn loose the horns on the altar till Solomon promises me he won't kill me. Remember when Michael Corleone's wife says, Did you have your brother-in-law murdered? And he said, Kate, don't ever ask me about my work. And she said, Did you? And he said, Just this once. No. And of course he did. He did. So, I think Puzo may have read this book, you say. Um, Solomon's going to promise Adonijah anything he wants at this point. He's going to promise him anything he wants. So Solomon responded. If he proves to be a worthy man, and of course only Solomon would get to determine whether he was worthy or not, not one of his hairs shall fall to the ground, but if wickedness is found in him, he will die. Then King Solomon sent to have him brought down from the altar... So he, Adonijah, came to do obeisance to King Solomon, and Solomon said to him, Go home. And it's almost like Michael saying about Fredo, his brother, I don't want anything to happen to Fredo as long as our mother lives. When mother dies, take Fredo fishing. and Don't bring him back. Remember? Well, Puzo read the book here. When David's time to die drew near, he charged his son Solomon, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, be courageous, keep the charge of Yahweh your Elohim, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, as it is written in the Torah of Moses, so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. All right, verse 10, skip to 10. Then David slept with his ancestors, which means he died, and was buried in the city of David. Let me uh, warn all of you who are going to Israel with us in February. I've asked them not to take us to that tomb that they always want to take us to because it's not the real one. And, uh, I, you know, I can have just so much sway. Uh, first thing I know, I'll look up and there will be at the tomb. That's not the tomb of David. But anyway, they buried him there in the city of David, the new city, Jerusalem. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years, you remember. He reigned seven years in Hebron over just the southern tribes and 33 years in Jerusalem after he united them. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. That is, everybody acknowledges, okay, David didn't choose Adonijah, he chose Solomon, let's move forward, except Solomon has a little unfinished business here. And if Adonijah and Joab and the others gathered once to make Adonijah king, they might do it again. And Machiavelli would write a book called The Prince centuries later and say, if you ever have an insurrection against the prince, you better kill him. You better kill him. 
because he's going to kill you if you don't. Okay. Verse 13. Then Adonijah, son of Hagit, came to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. She asked, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. Then Adonijah said, May I have a word with you? She said, Go on. He said, You know that the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. And now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. She said to him, Go on. He said, Please ask King Solomon, he will not refuse you, to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Stop and think. That was a big mistake Absalom made. Remember? Absalom has rallied an army. He's marching on Jerusalem. David finally hears of it, rounds up what few he can, gets all the family. They start down the winding road to the Jordan River from Jerusalem, 17 miles down to the river. Absalom takes over the capital, takes over the palace, and one of his advisors says to show everybody you really are taking your father's place. You need to spend the night with the ten concubines he left here to keep everything cleaned up. Remember? That's what it says. All the family and all of David's closest warriors hurry down the road to the Jordan River. They left ten concubines in the palace to look after things. And Absalom is told, spend the night with your father's concubines, and everybody will know you are the man. So Adonijah sees some symbolism here, you know. Uh, he may think his father was sexually sleeping with Abishag. We don't know. This author says he wasn't. Anyway, of all the women he could have, he wants that one. Has that ever made sense to you, the way they trade spouses in Hollywood? I mean, when we know somebody's spent two, three years with five, six different people and somebody gets to be a star, he wants her or she wants him, which always seems really weird to me. Of all the ones you could pick from now, why do you want that one that five others have already had for several years apiece? But that's the way it seems to go. So, of all the women in the realm, I want that one. Bathsheba said, very well, I will speak to the king on your behalf. Notice how the language changes. If you notice how around the White House, even family members, I don't mean just now, Jacqueline Kennedy always referred to John as the president, the president. She doesn't say, I'll talk to my son about that. No, I will speak to the king on your behalf. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. The king rose to meet her, bowed down to her. Then he sat on his throne, had a throne brought for the king's mother, and she sat on his right hand. Then she said, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. Same words that Adonijah used with her. And the king said to her, Make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. She said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to your brother Adonijah as his wife. King Solomon answered his mother, And why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom as well. I mean, do you realize what you're saying here? You want me to give the woman who slept with my father all these years to my enemy? The one who was trying to usurp the throne? Ask for him the kingdom as well, for he is my elder brother. I mean, there are a lot of people who already think he ought to have the throne. We cannot add to their thinking he should have the throne because he's oldest surviving son. Ask not only for him, but also for the priest, Abiathar, and Joab, son of Zariah. In other words, Solomon has his list. He knows who's not been faithful. 
Adonijah number one, the priest who went with Adonijah number two, and David's commanding officer, Joab, who went with Adonijah as well. He knows them very well, and he's got the list. So may God do to me, and more also, for Adonijah has devised this scheme at the risk of his life. Now therefore, as Yahweh lives, who has established me and placed me on the throne of my father David, and who has made me a house as he promised, today Adonijah shall be put to death. So King Solomon sent Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. He struck him down, and he died. Number one enemy, gone. Verse 28. When the news came to Joab, for Joab had supported Adonijah, though he had not supported Absalom. Remember, he killed Absalom. Joab did. In that battle in Gilead, he had been absolutely loyal to David, even went a step beyond when David had said, Spare my son Absalom. Joab took it into his own hands and killed him. But this time, Joab's bet on the wrong horse. He went to the crowning of Adonijah. And he knows when Adonijah's dead, he's next on the list. Remember how when we invaded Iraq, we had a deck of cards? The ace, the king, the queen, the, you know? All right. He's number two card, and he knows it. So Ab uh, Joab fled to the tent of Yahweh and grasped the horns of the altar. Now it's his turn. When it was told King Solomon, Joab has fled to the tent of the Lord and now is beside the altar, Solomon sent Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. In other words, his commanding officer. He doesn't send a priest to say a prayer with him. He sends the guy with the little crooked knife. Verse 34, you can skip all the rest of those verses. Here's the kicker. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, went up and struck Joab down and killed him, and he was buried at his own house near the desert. Verse 36. So who's left in the deck? The priest. The priest, Zadok, stayed with David and Solomon, but the others did not. They went with Adonijah. Then the king sent and summoned Shimei, said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and live there, and do not go out from there to any place whatever, for on the day you go out and cross the Wadi Kidron, know for certain that you shall die. Your blood shall be on your own head. And Shimei said to the king, The sentence is fair. As my lord the king has said, so will your servant do. So Shimei lived in Jerusalem many days. Okay, let me remind you just about the, the geography around the capital city again. David took from the Jebusites one hill called Mount Zion. Solomon will later build the temple on the adjoining hill called Moriah. And then the little valley between the two of them was filled in. So it became one continuous hill, if you would. Mount Zion and Mount Moriah joined together. On the west side of these two joined hills, the valley where the Jebusites offered human sacrifice to their gods, considered really verboten kind of place to the Jews, so they used it for the city dump, you remember. The valley of Hinnom became Gehenna, the hellfire that burns all the time. On the east side, the beautiful little wadi, it had almost no water in the dry season, but which ran full in the winter when it rained, the wadi Kidron. And it was just right outside the city gates, I've told you, the main old wall portion of the city. <clears throat> so he's telling him, this priest, do not cross the wadi, the Kidron wadi, that close to the capital city. If you do, I'm going to kill you. So for a long time, he did exactly what Solomon had told him. But after a while, verse 39, it happened at the end of three years that two of Shimei's slaves ran away. Verse 40, Shimei arose and saddled a donkey 
and went to Achish in Gath to search for his slaves. Verse 41, when Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and returned, he's definitely crossed the Kidron Wadi. The king sent and summoned Shimei and said to him, Did I not make you swear by Yahweh and solemnly adjure you, saying, Know for certain that on the day you go out and go to any place whatsoever. In other words, he was under a kind of house arrest. You shall die. And you said to me three years ago, The sentence is fair. I accept. So let's get to the, skip the details, get to verse 46. Then the king commanded Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. So the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Okay? He had three on the list. He's crossed them all off. They're all dead. Solomon can move on. All right? Let's look at chapter 3. Here we are about to learn how wise Solomon was and how foolish Solomon was. He's wise in that he decides, if I marry the daughters of as many different rival chieftains as possible, those chieftains are not as likely to attack me if they have grandchildren asleep in the palace. The only problem was Solomon had nothing to do with the children and all these pagan wives he brought into the palace raised their children to worship pagan gods. So on the one hand he was smart, on the other hand he was foolish and Israel would pay for his foolishness for generations to come. Okay, but let's get a little of that detail. We won't do, deal with all of it. Chapter 3 first marriage here, Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Whoa. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of Yahweh and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of Yahweh. Okay, stop and think with me. The high places, you remember? Mm, high places. Temples to the gods and goddesses of fertility were built on the high places. When we went to Sicily, where Gail's grandparents, paternal grandparents both came from, uh, one of the things that we wanted to see were the temples the ruins of the temples. Now, Sicily's been sort of like Poland. Every time there's a war, they get overrun. So, Sicily was under the hand of the Greeks at the time of Alexander the Great and following. They were under the hand of the Romans during all those times of the Caesars. So, they had Greek temples to the pagan gods, gods and goddesses, when the Romans conquered them and Constantine decided to embrace Christianity, in time all those Greek temples to the pagan gods and goddesses of fertility were converted to Christian churches. And then over the centuries they fell into disrepair. And so on the tops of the hills in Sicily you still have some of these beautifully preserved columns standing up that sort of resemble the Parthenon in Athens, you know, when you look at them from a distance. The only problem is, if you want to see them, they're built at the top of the hill, parking lots at the bottom of the hill. So you have to climb. You have to walk up if you want to see. But nonetheless, they are there. Why at the top of the hill? Because you can see them. When you take a cruise down the Rhine River, Every little village you come to, you see a cross at the top of the tallest hill. They built the palace on one hill and the church on the other. Palace and the church. Palace, because it's more easily defended at the top of the hill. Old weapons aided by gravity. Spears and arrows and so on, better from the top of the hill. Lee won a major battle when he had the top of the hill. He lost a major battle at Gettysburg when he was at the bottom of the hill. Okay, so 
um, the people were still worshiping at the high places. And again, I can recommend Missioner's The Source for you, where James Missioner went to Israel after the Israelite, the Jews, had control of it again after World War II and began to do serious archaeological digging into their past. And two of the first old villages they dug down into were Bethel and Ai, A-I, Bethel and Ai, and Missioner followed those digs, watching, making notes, and when they got to the bottom, Missioner began his book. And the chapters bring you right back up to the present day. Okay? He has graphic descriptions of what those temples at the top of the hill built to the gods and goddesses of fertility were all about. And a part of it was the prostitutes who worked there. They had both male and female. Take your pick. They had male and female prostitutes. And uh, the Israelite men tried to convince their wives they were doing something really wonderful to go up the hill and cavort with the prostitutes to inspire the gods and goddesses of fertility to stomp around the heavens and cause rain. And then the crops would grow or to make all the youths have lambs and all the cows have calves and all the women have babies. You know, they sold that for several centuries there that uh, the women seemed to buy it because they didn't have much choice. Uh, that's what's going on early on in Solomon's reign. It's going on in Solomon's reign. Okay. Um, Solomon loved Yahweh, we're told, verse 3, walking in the statutes of his father David. But look, only he did sacrifice and offer incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. But at Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I should give you. Now stop and think with me here. We're dealing with very old sources here that were first told around campfires. Remember, only after there's a temple... Only after you have an educated priesthood who can read and write do you get the stories written down. And we know that in the older strand between uh, J and E, the older of those two, when God wants to talk to folks, he just walks right up and says, Morning, Adam, how are you doing? Fine. You okay, Eve? I'm fine. In the source that we think is a little bit later and a little bit more sophisticated, I mean, when people would say, now, wait a second. Did God really just walk up and speak to you? They started saying, well, no. And how did you see God or hear God in my spirit or in my dreams? Okay. When we arrived in Tulsa, in the summer of 1980, Oral Roberts had just run out of money on the City of Faith. And he was quoted in the newspapers as saying that he walked out onto that flat piece of land where the structural steel was going up. They were paying for it every week. And now the money had stopped and that he fell down on his knees when everybody had gone home that Friday afternoon and saw this massive steelwork going up and towering over it all the figure of Jesus. And the Tulsa World and Tribune said, Oral Roberts sees 900-foot Jesus. Remember? First Sunday I was here and preached, Oral and Evelyn were here, and later we got to know them a little bit better, a little bit better. And he, in reflecting back on that, said, what he told me was, 
I never said I saw Jesus with my eyes. I said I saw him in my spirit. That's a very different thing, you see. That's a very different thing. That's what he said. I said in my spirit I saw Jesus looming over the city of faith and saying, if I want it built, I can get it built, and so on. All right, so Solomon has a dream. This is a little more sophisticated an experience of God in a dream. God said, notice here, this is the older name for God, El Elohim, the God who seems remote as to Eye Asher, Eye, I am who I am, the one who seems more intimate, if you would, or imminent, is the way theologians talk about it, the imminent God and the transcendent God. Uh, we're talking about the same being, of course, but the names used can sometimes help you here. The God who seemed remote, and I bet he does seem remote if Solomon's worshiping at the high places, asked, ask what I should give you. Last May, when Bishop Hayes preached the ordination service during annual conference, right here from our pulpit, he used this text. This was the text he used in preaching to newly ordained women and men. Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great chesed, that's what it says, H-E-S-E-D with a rough breathing mark over it, it's called. German has it. Hebrew has it, sort of like that, chesed, usually translated for us as steadfast love or never failing love. You have shown great chesed to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, meaning doing what's right, and in uprightness of heart toward you, and you have kept for him this great chesed, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Eye Asher Eye, my Elohim, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. Now, he's not physically a little child. In age, he's not a little child. But he means, compared to my father, I'm still a child. Okay. It's the right attitude. Saul had it when he first became king. David had it when he first became king. Solomon's starting out, well, at this point, I'm not worthy, is what he's saying in effect. I'm not worthy. I'm like a child. I do not know how to go out or come in like a child. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this great people? Okay, and so our bishop was saying to ordinands, you see, if you're going to become pastoral leaders of United Methodist Churches in Oklahoma, I hope you're asking God tonight to give you an understanding mind so that you may discern the difference between what is good and what is evil. Verse 10, It pleased Eye Asher Eye, or Yahweh, that Solomon had asked this, God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or for the life of your enemies, uh, Solomon's pretty much taken care of them, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. 
If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Remember, there were many in that day who believed, if you live a long time and have a bunch of kids and end up with enough to eat and drink for the whole life, you must have been a good person. The book of Job is written to refute that as being always true. It's not always true. But that was the understanding. If you live a long time, that's why they keep telling you how old some of these people were. If you live a long time and you have a bunch of kids and uh, you end up with something to eat and drink at the end of your life, you did well. Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. Isn't it convenient? You know, I'm not saying God doesn't speak to us in our dreams, but dream research seems to show that our brains keep working after we go to sleep, and they're trying to sort out things that didn't get sorted out during the daytime. The only thing that makes a problem is that our dreams confuse different problems and scrunch them all up together. I mean, a problem at work and a problem at home, they get all you know scrunched up together and it makes for a weird, weird dream, according to what I've read from those who do this sort of research. But our brains keep working into the night. I know for me, when I was in, in seminary, in graduate school, we had to do so much reading and writing and reading and writing. There were students who would set their alarms and get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to study for a final. I had rather, and it worked better for me, to study till 4 if I needed to, and then go to bed and get up 15 minutes before the exam, and, you know, eat a bite, brush my teeth, and go take it. I, I always felt my brain kept working on it if I had it on my mind just before I slept. All right. Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. He came to Jerusalem where he stood before the ark, that beautiful box holding the Ten Commandments. He offered up burnt offerings and offerings of shalom and provided a feast for all his servants. Okay. So, he leaves the high places, comes back to the tent of the presence, stands before this beautiful box holding the two stone tablets, and hopefully he and God have gotten off to a good start here. And the storyteller immediately tells all of us a story to show that, in fact, God has granted his wish. Solomon does have a discerning mind. And of all the stories in the Bible about Solomon's wisdom, this is the one that probably more people know than any other. It's about the two women claiming one baby. You know this story very well. But let's read it just because it, it is told right here, right now, to show that Solomon was in fact given a wonderful discerning mind. He could tell who was right, who was wrong, what was good, what was bad. Later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. So the fact that they're prostitutes, people who worked up at the hill shrines, uh, they're sort of a lower strata here, uh, poor white trash down in Texas, we probably call them, came to the king and stood before him. I mean, what right do they have? Nonetheless, one woman said, Please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. Rolled over on him. He died. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly it was not the son I had borne. But the other woman said, No, the living son is mine. The dead son is yours. The first said, No, the dead son is yours. The living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king said, The one says, This is my son that is alive, and your son is dead, while the other says, Not so, your son is dead, and my son is the living one. So the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living boy in two. Give half to one, half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive, that is, the one who knew this living one was her, said to the king, 
because compassion for her son burned within her. Please, my Lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, It shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then the king responded, Give the first woman the living boy. Do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel, I mean, a story like that would spread. Would it not? All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. That is, Solomon knew how to do right and avoid doing wrong. All right, let's go to chapter 4. We have a few minutes left. Chapter 4, verse 20. Judah and Israel. Notice here they're still being differentiated in this author's mind. Judah, southern tribes. Israel, northern tribes. David has united them. Solomon maintains that unity. Still, everybody's aware of the difference. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. I mean, happy days are here again. Solomon's doing great things. Solomon was sovereign over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines, even to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Okay, now stop and think what this author has just told you. Solomon controls all this territory, the author has just said, to the Euphrates. It's in modern-day Iraq, of course, ancient Babylon. From the Euphrates River all the way south, up, those Philistines are still troublesome in what is today the Gaza Strip, all the way down to the Philistines and then all the way down to what is today the Suez, Egypt. That's a lot of territory. Solomon is in control, has the greatest power of all of that. Skip to verse 25. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, south and north, lived in safety. Now here the twelve tribes are mentioned again in their extremities. From Dan even to Beersheba, all of them under their vines and fig trees. It's an image of plenty, okay? The fig trees are bearing and the vines are making grapes and we can make wine and we have sheep and we have wheat so that we can make bread. When you get to Israel in February, we will go north of the lake, Sea of Galilee, up to Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is the place, according to Mark, Simon said, you are the Christ or the Messiah of God. Okay, right here. All right, Dan, the tribe of Dan settled here. Okay, here. You have people who live there. Some of them now are the Druze. You'll see some of them. This is a demilitarized zone right along the lake there. And you will see United Nations forces who've been there for years and years and years, since the 1967 war, um, patrolling. So for 43 years, they've been here as we, you know, are, have a demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. At nighttime, it's not unusual, uh, when you sleep at Tiberias, to hear maneuvers across the lake training of Israeli uh, soldiers over there. Uh, you will see bunkers from the pre-1967 war where the enemy was. You will be shown little communities there where children had lived from 1947 till 1967, 20 years that they had never slept through a whole night without being forced into the bomb shelters. Um, so you'll see all of that. But in the time being described here, Dan the tribe of Dan, and then ten others in between, all the way down to the southernmost tribe of Judah, down to Beersheba, which is in the Negev Desert. 
Okay. And those of you who met Jacob on a couple of our trips guided us. Jacob had a son, daughter-in-law, and grandchildren who lived at Beersheba uh, when, when we were there before. So this territory. So first he says all the way through Euphrates to Egypt, then he says from Dan to Beersheba. Solomon controlled a lot of territory. Uh, let's look at chapter 5. Solomon's now going to get serious about building a temple and a palace. It's interesting to note. You remember what Samuel told the people that kings do? They take, even good ones like Solomon. He will spend seven years building the temple. He will spend 13 building the palace. Okay, I'm jumping ahead. Let's start with chapter 5. Now King Hiram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed Solomon king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of Yahweh, his Elohim, because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him, until Yahweh put them under the soles of his feet. But now Yahweh, my Elohim, has given me rest on every side, that is, peace, there is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of Yahweh my Elohim, as Yahweh said to my father David, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build a house for my name. Therefore command that cedars from the Lebanon be cut for me. My servants will join your servants, and I will give you whatever wages you set for your servants. For you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians." Okay, let's stop and just remember that just north, going on up the Mediterranean, I shouldn't have curved this quite so much here, going on up a little bit north, and when we go in February, the guides always want to show you a crusader fortress. I don't think you and I are nearly so interested, but a little over a thousand years ago, uh, the crusaders who were trying to reclaim the Holy Land from the infidels, as they saw the, the Muslims, uh, did get it as far, and, and at Accra, Accra, they built a fortress that still stands over a thousand years later. So that may be of interest to some of you. We'll all stop there for, for a brief time. But going right on up the coast, you are very familiar with the present country of Lebanon, and two of the port cities there are Tyre and Sidon. Still, Tyre and Sidon. The whole Eastern, Europe, Eastern Mediterranean world knew about the magnificent trees that grow in Lebanon. They are beautiful. They have enough water up there, and the soil conditions are just right, that these cedar trees are, are truly magnificent, I understand. I've never been into Lebanon myself. But the cedar trees are really amazing. Uh, as we get on to the prophets later, they will talk about God redeeming Israel from Babylon, that God will buy back, so to speak, his people and bring them back, and that Israel will be like a cedar of Lebanon with the other nations of the world nesting in its branches. So the, the cedar of Lebanon was a very important symbol to them. Jesus, of course, would say the kingdom of God will be like a mustard shrub. That's a whole other thing. The kingdom would be like a mustard shrub. The prophet said, like a cedar of Lebanon. So Solomon needs the timber, and Hiram is going to tell him, okay, he will fell these magnificent trees, get them to the water, float, you know, tie them together in su sufficiently in rafts to float them down, and then they can be taken overland to Jerusalem. All right, that's what the negotiating is all about here. When Hiram heard the words of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be Yahweh today, who has given to David a wise son to be over this great people. I mean, he's really wise if he's going to buy lots of cedar trees from me and then pay my workers whatever I tell him. So Hiram sent word to Solomon, I've heard the message you've sent to me. I will fulfill all your needs in the matter of cedar and cypress timber. My servants shall bring it down to the sea from the Lebanon. I will make it into rafts to go by sea to the place you tell me. I will have them broken up there for you to take away, and you shall meet my needs by providing food for my household. So Hiram supplied Solomon's every need for timber of cedar and cypress. Solomon in turn gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household, 20 cores of fine oil, that would be olive oil. Solomon gave this to Hiram year by year. So Yahweh gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him there was peace between Lebanon and Israel and Judah, and the two of them made a treaty. 
King Solomon conscripted forced labor out of all Israel. Palaces don't get made without lots of hard work. Temples don't get made without a lot of hard work. I've told you that it's always interesting to me to see Americans going through the magnificent palaces of Western Europe. I've seen people going through the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, and we Americans have so conditioned ourselves that we're sure we would have been dancing in the Hall of Mirrors, when in fact you and I would have been picking chickens. We would have been out back plucking the chickens. We would have been arranging all those little stones out there in the garden at Versailles, not dancing in the Hall of Mirrors. Um, Average folks have to work really hard for kings and queens to have these magnificent buildings they have. So King Solomon conscripted forced labor out of all Israel. The levy numbered 30,000 men. It takes a lot of folks to bring huge cedar trees all the way from the Mediterranean, 50 miles inland, to Mount, Mount Zion, Mount Moriah. Okay. He sent them to the Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. They would be a month in Lebanon, two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor. Solomon also had 70,000 laborers and 80,000 stonecutters in the hill country. Uh, When you go to Europe, you see the magnificent carvings on the buildings. We have some in this country, too, of course. And those those, uh, uh, artisans simply are not around today. You don't have people who know how to do that work, and we can't conscript conscript people now and make them learn a certain skill uh, as slaves for us, as it were. Besides Solomon's 3,300 supervisors who were over the work, having charge of the people who did the work. At the king's command, they quarried out great, costly stones in order to lay the foundation of the house with dressed stones. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the Gebelites did the stone cutting and prepared the temper and the stone to build the house. We better pause there. All right, we better pause there. We're not going to deal with all this detail that we did before. I promise you, we're not going to deal with all the details of the building and how much, uh, uh, how many uh, little cherubim were carved and so on. We'll deal with just the most important parts. I, um, I promise to, to do that. So next Sunday is August 8, and we'll start with Chapter 6. If you haven't been to church yet, let me tell you, Joel Pensera is going to play all those bells by himself by himself. 